Welcome, welcome everyone. All right, listen up. Today we got someone that's creating fantasy worlds and a fantasy adventure. Raising, uh, he was raised in the hills. Our guest spent years telling stories where heroes rise, villains fall, and magic is everywhere. He's the author of The Last Keeper, the first book in a four book series. He's already turning heads, even getting to pick up in a video game, which is amazing, by the way. But he's not just a writer. He's done a lot of work in D.C., running businesses. And also, he owns a Alternative Reality Magazine, which is pretty interesting and cool. You're in a treat uh, for him. He loves fantasy, Dungeons and Dragons. He, show, he has his shows, uh, Robotech, Castlevania. This guy is pretty amazing. So it's my honor to welcome you. This is Roku uh, Podcast, the one and only, JV or Joe Hillard. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to all your fans, man. Thanks for having me on tonight. Uh, no, no, no problem, man. You are pretty amazing and awesome yourself. So, man, I just really want to get into the questions, man, because it's like uh, just researching you and uh, you telling me everything about yourself. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing. So, uh, just writing in it, it's like, you know, you write amazing fantasy uh, series uh, with your your book series. What made you want to write about the world of magic and knights? Was it something like you had in your childhood as a kid or something of that nature? Yeah, there were really two events that happened and they both happened in my childhood. Um, the first was I fell in love with the concept of fantasy adventure when I was in the fourth or fifth grade. I had, a, I had an English teacher that went out on a medical sabbatical. And for the last month of the year, one of um, one of the substitute teachers apparently somehow got permission to read us the Lord of the Rings uh, and uh, the Hobbit. Uh, and so we got, you know, for, you know, 30 or 35 days, I got read that every day as my English class and fell in love with it. But, wow. you know, the more important side was I grew up in a household that was a little different than most people. Uh, my uncle, who was like a second father to me, was was paralyzed in the war. He was a Marine. Wow. And I grew up at his bedside. My mom was his nurse, and mm. uh, he was very limited in what he could do, right? As you can imagine, a quadriplegic. Uh, but two of the things he could do was, one, he could write, and it was a form of escapism for him. So he would, he would type on a keyboard just like we all did. And mm-hmm. at the time, you know, he would write short stories and pulp fiction that would show up in horror magazines and other things. He was really on the darker side of stuff. Uh, but mm-hmm. the other thing he he taught me to do right around the same time of the fantasy adventure stuff was Dungeons and Dragons. True. Again, that was a game that was a form of escapism for him. And I learned by his bedside. And of course, you always want to be what your dad does. So you, yeah. in my case, you know, I emulated him and I wanted to be a writer. Uh, and then life takes over. And yeah. I, you know, I get, you know, you graduate, you go to college, you have to find a job, you need money to, 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 buy a house, you get married, you want to have a family, all those things get in the way. And then COVID really started the idea of getting back to writing because there wasn't anything to do. Uh, While DC was shut down for almost a year and a half, there was no work to be done uh, in the way that it used to. And so I I took the stuff when I was younger and just fast forwarded it 20 years and dropped it into COVID. And I said, look, I'll, I'll, I'll make my silver lining I'll write that book I've been promising myself to write. And I dedicated it to my uncle and all the uh, nerds to play Dungeons and Dragons with me for 20 years. <laughs> True. <laughs> <laughs> so that's pretty awesome, man. And and I'm not going to skip about what you was talking about with your uncle being such a, a huge inspiration. It was like that from my grandmother. My mom was a nurse, a registered nurse. So she used to work her 12 hour, 13 hour shift. And then I used to meet her at my grandmother's house and while she take care of my grandmother. And my grandmother was so appreciative of that. And I know how it is. Uh, my gram, my grandma, or grand gram was such an inspiration. She taught me so much. And she said, I can do anything. And I always love fantasy. I love anime, cartoons, everything of that nature. So she always kind of inspired me and directed me towards the, that type of genre and just do anything I want. So I, I get it. I get about that. Your uncle being your inspiration. You know, you said before, you know, you like anime shows and how you like D&D and stuff like that, especially like Robotech and Castlevania. How, those, how do those shows inspire your writing? Well, you know, there are lessons in most of anime, 
like any any anime you you watch, it's going to take some form. It could be sci-fi, like Robotech. It could be fantasy adventure, like Demon Slayer. It can be horror, like Castlevania, right? Mm-hmm. And, and they all take on various forms. But deep dark secrets inside there, you're, there are nuggets of wisdom that you can take from them. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think that's what makes anime so interesting is that it's even though it's portrayed in a uh, in uh, it, through animation. Mm-hmm. and cartoonish story there are very adult themes in it and mm-hmm. you know i grew up you know falling in love with at the time what's called japanimation there was no anime yeah, it was that, just japanimation true, true. yeah and then yeah. you know japanimation became anime and it took on its own form and you got everything all of the forms of it that kind of come with that is this grown in, in popularity um but i think that it really reformed the way we saw cartoons. It wasn't Bug, Bu- Bug the Bunny ish or Woody the <laughs> Woodpecker anymore. It was action oriented. It was films, but done in, a, in, a, in an illustrative, cartoonish way. And you can get away with a lot there. And it made it interesting. And for guys like me who grew up reading comic books, uh, it, it jumped off the page, right? Because for me, it was it was just as cool as me re- reading a book, except in this case, it was like a comic book come to life. And you you find all of those those I think stories you know in in Robotech it it talks about a world coming together to defend itself against a you know a greater evil and then you yeah. also learn that you know the the differences between people and the Zentradi and of course you know the the humans yeah. you know, it was a matter of or the Micronians as they called us uh, you know it was a matter of them learning more about us and those cultures intermingling to find out that they were we were really a lot like one another and there are things that you can take away from those lessons in castlevania you know again it's it's almost like you know the redemption arcs which you know are part of my story is part of most good stories whether it's darth vader or in this case dracula finding a redemption arc because he falls in love with a woman who's killed at the hands of the catholic church i mean that's some diabolical yeah. stuff yeah but it's done in a way where it's cartoonish yeah. and you kind of fall in love with it so you, you just you look for those nuggets of wisdom and those are things you could take away to learn about in your everyday life and also is something that I bake into my story writing. Mm. You know, it's one thing you said about redeemed, and a lot, a lot about anime, especially in your books. You talk about, you know, being redeemed, like, um, like the main protagonist in your, uh, your, your starting book, where he got the foresight, right, and then from there he got this all powerful foresight, and then it was the uh, what uh, the, uh, the banished. Um, the guy who had foresight and he was up and against him and he was basically trying to redeem his order. And it's like, and then with the princess uh, going and being involved with her, I, I seen so many parallels to so many different things of about just life in general that we go through. And it, it makes me, um, it's something I always say, uh, especially with my troops. I said, nothing comes for free. Like any type of redemption um, comes with a price. And I said, everybody likes a good comeback story. I said, so make sure your comeback story is something that someone will enjoy to read, you know, just in life in general. So man, I, I do, I do like that in your writing and I, and I like that just in just overall writing. I like, I like that. I was, uh, I was a kid and I, I like the, the, the Marvel, the uh, DC, but the real good stuff I like, the comic books I like, I'm not sure if you know, Dark Horse. Dark oh, Horse of course, comic. yeah. Oh, yeah. man, I used, to, I used to get my butt whooped for having Dark Horse comics because, you know, it was just really, really dark. It, the, the drawing, the style and everything like that. And my mom was like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, this is not right. Yeah, that happened to me <laughs> when the Batman, when they, they launched the Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. And it was the follow up and Batman was older and Rob, the first Robin had been killed yeah. at the end of the series. And then they brought in a second Robin, which was a girl and she was killed in the first episode yeah. uh, and things like that. And those were things that, you know, when my mom looked at my comics, she's like, what's going on here? You know what I mean? <laughs> you, you, you're, you're 10 years old. Why are you reading all this? It should be fun stuff and Archie and all yeah. that. And you know, I'm reading the dark night under my pillow with a flashlight. Right. You yeah. know, it's like, yeah, things like this. I, I feel your, I yeah, feel your pain, yeah. hiding stuff like that, and that, and it got really kind of, you know, and, and I think that's why graphic novels have taken off. It's like mm-hmm. those guys like you and I that liked it as a kid still want to enjoy the yeah. genre of it, and so we want more adult stuff. We don't don't talk down to us anymore, but make yeah. a Walking Dead, 
you know, make something that co- aliens, uh, you know, make that come out predator. Yeah. There are a lot of those things that were spinoffs and, you know, m- movies are made from them. Mm-hmm. John Wick is a example yeah. of that. Like Constantine, like there are so many of them, but they're darker because they're more adultish. Yeah. Um, and, and therefore folks like you and I can enjoy them in our middle years yeah. uh, in the same way we enjoyed them when we were in our younger years uh, without having to hide them from our parents. Uh, very true. Very true. Um, you know, you know, if you can work in any anime studio, you know, um, and turn your book into a show, which one would you choose and why? So I'm going to go back in time a little bit okay. uh, because it's, it's a, it's an OG. It's, it's Harmony Gold. Harmony Gold Gold. came out with Robotech in the mid to late 80s. Okay. And it was one of the first shows I fell in love with. Now, of course, I was watching reruns, you know, after the fact. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the Harmony Gold folks, I wish they would sell the franchise so that someone can make a live action movie out Mm. of it. I mean, the, the stories were so good. It had basically... The Macross saga from, you know, the, the fir- it really drew me in. It was this, you know, World War, f- you know, three kind of thing where, you know, you get this rogue uh, alien spaceship with no one on it that smashes into the planet. And they know that the Zentradi are coming, but the Zentradi mm-hmm. have to find it. Yep. And we've got like 20 years to catch up. And the world puts aside all of its differences and says, you know what? Those things don't matter anymore. We've got these eight big bad aliens coming after us. We got to fix this ship and defend Earth from it, mm-hmm. and that in itself I thought was just a cool concept. And their their animation at the time was second to none. There was nobody that was better than them, uh, and I think a lot of the Japan animation that became that migrated into to uh, anime came from that. So if I had to pick one, I would say it would be Harmony Gold Productions. Okay, but. Like the 1980s Harmony Gold production, yeah, yeah, yeah. like going now, go way back clock, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah if they if they can go back to that, you know, or keep those same standards. I think a lot has changed post COVID. A lot of things have changed, especially with uh, individuals like yourself who became writers who did a lot of different things that was totally different. But you use that to channel your inner child. I, I don't even like to say inner child because it's like a lot of the storylines are created by adults for adults to convey real life situations, right? So uh, I wouldn't even say that. I would just say, uh, how, how would I express it? It's like you wanted to do not something different. I don't even want to put you in a box. It's just you wanted to do something that meant something that that you can leave a legacy for. And man, I, I can respect that so much. So Yeah, you know, I, Authors look at it in a way where when we're writing something, it has to be identifiable to the reader. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned the redemption arc before. Like everyone sees the redemption path that Anakin Skywalker was on with Darth Vader. And you cheer for him if his return, that second chance, right? And does he choose that path of redemption? Other things that are part of that are struggles that people can identify with. I mean, you mentioned, you know, Damus, who's my main character in the novels, you know, is given this power uh, of sight. And he uses it to to help defend his order from the fallen keeper who's coming back uh, to destroy it. And mm-hmm. you know you get that that almost Darth Vader Luke Skywalker thing going, yeah. whether you got this chosen one versus you know the the false prophet. But people can identify with that because they see that in real life, or they see other struggles in real life, whether they have physical disabilities or socioeconomic disability. Maybe they don't make as much money as they need, or they have a health condition, you know, or they're in a situation. And so. When you put characters, fantasy or sci-fi or not, into those scenarios, people can identify with them and they, they naturally cheer for their heroes because they want to see them do well. Uh, and, you know, even though it's make-believe and we make it up, like you said, you know, those are things that you think of. Like, I thought of some of these storylines when I was in high school. Yeah. You know, it just took me 20 years to write them. You know, <laughs> so like, you know, it's, it's, it's goofy to think of it that way. But, you know, uh, you, you, I think as a kid, your mind's open to all those possibilities because you don't know any better. Yeah. And you're not beat down by the world, so you cheer for these heroes that we make up. Um, and you know, whether it's a sports hero and you're getting an autograph somewhere, or you know, a political hero and you're and you're going to a rally somewhere, it doesn't matter. You're you're looking for that as a kid, something you can identify with. And and fantasy adventure was definitely one of those things that, that stuck with me. Wow. 
See, that's amazing. And and I wonder how did that like channel into you, you know, running all your businesses and uh, while, you know, being a writer, like you have your businesses and then COVID hits and then so everything kind of slows down. You become a writer and now, you know, post COVID, everything's open again. You know, what is the hardest point about doing both, having those businesses, but also being a very uh, a critically acclaimed writer? You know, the hardest part about it, and this is going to sound dumb, is whenever I'm, I'll be driving or I'll be traveling or I'll be in a meeting and all of a sudden, oh, this idea popped into my head and you're like, oh, and you have to write it down somewhere or I'll dictate it on my phone while I'm driving or something. And, and then you go back six hours later and you see this scribble that I'm supposed to remember what I thought, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, what does that mean? What does two spine whip mean? You know what I mean? Like, I don't even know what that means. And then you sit there, you, you figure that stuff out. So sometimes it's in the note taking, but it's also keeping them like left brain, right brain. Like my mm-hmm. day jobs are really l- l- logical and regimented and mm-hmm. you have to be a good business person. So you have to think in a way. And then this is my escapism. Mm-hmm. I throw everything aside and no rules are, you know, you, there is no holds barred in any fantasy. You could do whatever you want. You know, yeah. there's no gravity. Too yeah. bad. You know, the sky's yeah. purple. <laughs> Too bad. You could do whatever you want. Right. And yeah. so for me, I, I use that to escape from the real world, the pressures of it. And, um, in some cases, you know, I find that as I'm working toward a retirement, I'd love to, there's not a single thing about writing that I couldn't do every day, Mm. the rest of my life. I mean, sitting somewhere, making up stories, typing them, and then seeing people react to them is a lot of, it's a lot more fun than what I'm doing. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for, my, for, my, for my real day jobs I pay the bills <laughs> I do got a question because I was talking to uh, another writer Danielle uh, Alsona and she was telling me how like when she was writing her her fantasies about uh, fae and dragons and stuff of that nature she was saying how she went to like different um, scientists and asking them if there was a dragon right um how would he actually look and how would he actually spit fire or how would he spit ice or, you know, different things of that nature, right? As a writer, do you find it very difficult for yourself to get very technical when you're trying to explain things? Like, for instance, you know, like uh, uh, I, I'll give you a perfect example of uh, Star Trek for the Trekkies, you know, warp engines. Like they they explained it as, you know, um, warp is like not curling space, but actually um, having space move through or around them. I forgot, I forgot how they explained it. You know what I'm saying? But they ex- it had to be written first to explain. And do you find it difficult for yourself to do that? Uh, no, actually, I enjoy it. You know, part mm-hmm. of it is, and I know Danielle. Danielle's great. And her mm-hmm. face stories, if anybody's listening, they should go check out Danielle M. Orsino. She's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll like her stuff. Uh, on for me, though, I, you know, I always enjoy those details, right? So doing the research behind how a privy in a castle works or what a falcon eats or things like that, all of those little details yeah. make the story because most people, when they, when you confront them with it, they might not know the answer and mm-hmm. you give them the answer. Or like you said about warp speed, you give them just enough, mm-hmm. right? Like Star Trek doesn't have to explain the science. Like most of us aren't going to understand it anyway. Mm-hmm. But like you said, well, they kind of warp the space time and that allows them to move it's like okay you know that's good enough for me like yeah, i'll yeah. accept that so and what danielle was doing with her dragons was how would that really work mm-hmm. you know in in my case same thing true i mean like it's hard to explain how a spell is created mm-hmm. so you create things like you're moving your hands and you're saying these funky ancient words and yeah. you're using spell components that you you smash things together you can create a potion with them and you know or you're praying to a god like all those kind of things and there are no rules there, but you give it just enough believability mm-hmm. so that the reader can suspend disbelief and they're like, all right, I can go along with it. You know, but you can't have something that's all powerful, all knowing, all seeing, you know, those kind of things are really difficult without some level of explanation. So doing research on it, I think helps me. And I enjoy having those and sliding just enough nuggets of that kind of science or wisdom or information mm-hmm. to folks like I, I, perfect example in my books. I create, there's a situation where there's a healer and she comes to one of the warriors who's suffering from soreness from battle and she allows him to chew on this slippery elm bark, 
Yeah. And if I said slippery elmberg, no one even knows what that is. But if you really look it up, it's a Wiccan homeopathic cure. It literally has, it, it's it's almost like ibuprofen that's grown through slippery elm bark and you just chew on it and it, it, it takes care. And so I used it through research. And if anybody wanted to call me on it, I could say, look at that Wiccan guide. It's right there. And mm-hmm. whether or not you do want to chew on that or you want to take a pill, or whatever you want to do, doesn't matter. I gave you a reason to believe that there was something behind it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's the kind of stuff that that helps pull a level of reality into a very fantastical realm. Mm. So in in your books, have you ever received any uh, feedback or criticism um, from your fans that probably, <laughs> yeah, that probably like, you like, eh, I don't think that's valid. Or are you like, eh, maybe I, I see where you're going with that. Yeah, uh, th- that is the number one way <laughs> that you improve as an author, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Iron sharpens iron. Yeah. And when someone tells you, and they're being honest, and mm-hmm. there's constructive criticism to it, it can't be just, I didn't like that book, one star yeah. on your Amazon review. That doesn't help anybody. Yeah. Tell me why you didn't like it, or tell me what I, I'm doing right or what I'm doing wrong so that I can improve it. And all authors get better with the next book they write. So my first book, As Proud As I Am is with My First Baby, it's not my best book. My best book will always be my last book. Yeah. The one I wrote because I've taken all of that wisdom that I've earned over years of writing and apply it each time so that my trade gets better, right? It's the same thing. If you're a mechanic yeah. for 20 years or if you're a mechanic for two, who's better? Yeah. Master Sergeant, yeah. right? You're like, hey, let me, let me, let me, let me fit E7. Like, yeah. let me guess, yeah, let me guess who's better at their trade. It's the guy that's been doing it for 20 years, right? Yeah. So for us, I don't mind the criticism and I'll, I'll be at conventions or book signings or I'll be at places where folks will come up to me and say, please don't kill this character or why did you kill this character <laughs> or what, why, you know, why didn't you do this? And, you know, and you, you listen to it and you take stock in what you think and then make it better the next time around. Or you t- there's some validity to mm-hmm. some of the complaints and you're like, oh, you know what? Yeah, there, there might be something there, but you have to be open-minded to it. And you have mm-hmm. to understand that even though in your head it was perfect and someone else's, it might not have been. And so mm-hmm. this is a way uh, for you to improve as a writer And you can't just, you could dismiss the trolls. I mean, the trolls are there just because they don't have anything better to do. But if someone comes to you and they point out something that's very valid, they're just helping you. And until you can, once you're, you get enough of a thick skin around your ego (laughs) to allow you to accept constructive criticism. And that's very important for authors. Um, You know, and I tell people this a lot, like there's something in our, our realm called beta readers and beta readers are people that are reading advanced reader copies of your stuff. Mm-hmm. And they're like movie critics. Like you, if you've ever seen a movie yeah. that they show three different endings in three different theaters and the one that has the most popular ending becomes the official ending of the movie. Mm-hmm. The other two might not have been bad, but you're listening to your audience and you're yeah. saying this one's the better one. Mm-hmm. Right. And same thing holds true for us. So when you send out our advanced reader copies, of an almost final manuscript to people that read our stuff a lot and they come back with questions. It's like, okay, well, before this really goes to print, Mm -hmm. let me address all those questions. And I need to thank them for pointing out errors or holes or Mm -hmm. omissions that I might've had in my plots or something they didn't like about my characters. And at that point you're like, great, well, let's, uh, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's move on and make this a better product because that's what it needs to be. And so just have to be open-minded to it Mm -hmm. and have a thicker skin. Yeah, and that is true. Like, man, <laughs> you never like that. So, let's talk about your books being turned into video games and graphic novels. How much are you helping to create those projects? And what was the part of that that was so far, like, I would say, like, beyond your scope that you was like, man, I probably don't want to do this. Yeah, so that's an easy question. Mm -hmm. Uh, So in truth, the video game and the graphic novel, you learn quickly that you're out of your element. Mm -hmm. You know, at first you're like, well, you know, this is my baby and don't touch it and don't do anything I don't want to do. And, you know, when I was sitting down with the video game company, they're like, we just need you on storyboarding. And I'm like, yeah, but, but, and they're like, look, you just trust us. You know, it's a different medium. It would like be them coming in and trying to write a novel and then Mm -hmm. me telling them to get out of the way. And what I meant by that is, you know, during the process of storyboarding, you realize a game is a different medium. A graphic um, novel is a different medium. And I'll give you two examples. The game, the problem with the game is, in my books, they're very linear, right? I know exactly what's going to happen at every stage, and I'm planning out a plot line 
Mm-hmm. That's why it's called a plot line. It's very linear. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go from point A to point B, and you're going to enjoy my story. In a video game, you there are no lines. Yeah. You could create an avatar for yourself and go help the villains. You could fight the good guys, or you could fight the bad guys. You don't have to follow the game. Yeah. So therefore, it's asymmetrical. Mm. And, and as, as a result, you know, they have to plan for everything. So they asked me to create guardrails for them so that here, the basic plot is here. But in case someone does these 20 things that don't fit the plot, we still have to have a game that they're playing. It can't just end because they chose the wrong adventure. Hey, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. On the graphic novel side, I write epic fantasy. So epic fantasy is you know, 150,000 words, 450, 500 words a book mm-hmm. um, and greater. And all of a sudden you open a comic book and what do you see? Eight pages or, you know, you, you see eight frames yeah. on two pages through 28 mm-hmm. pages and you get 10 letters to fit on there yeah. or, or we have four words that are going to fit in a box where, you know, and maybe on some there's, there's dialogue, yeah. but you're now taking something that I just, I described in three pages and boiling it down to one frame yeah. and you have to show emotion and you have to show movement and you got to do all these other things. And so not everything that's in my book is going to get into the graphic novel. Mm-hmm. And that's what you learn right away. And you just have to accept the fact that your baby's being transformed into something that's in a different medium that you don't understand how to do and just get out of the way of it. Mm-hmm. Be there to be helpful, but don't be in the way, right? Okay. And, and, and as soon as you get that and you accept it, things go a lot smoother. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that sounds like a lot because I I have read graphic novels. I lived in Japan for seven years, and uh, sometimes you know um, I was trying to learn Japanese. Man, reading uh, uh, katakana, hiragana, and uh, just kanji in general is so dang difficult because uh, <laughs> you know how they they read. You know we read from um, left to right. They read from right to yeah. left. So man, no, it's like. Uh, it's something else. So I, I get you there. It's a lot. And graphic novels explain so much in greater detail. So I, I do get you on that. So, you know, you said something about your characters, you know, uh, being kind of like based in anime, um, you know. Um, so if you can have one of your characters for a day, who would it be and why? Have them in what way? Like see them. Come I would to say life? if you can have them in the way of uh, like live through live through them, and if you can live through them for just one day. Yeah. So mine would be Sir Ritter of Vulcanier, uh, because mm. Sir Ritter I actually played as a Dungeons and Dragons character. Okay. And so I've already kind of lived through him vicariously through my piece of paper and and my twenty sided die, uh, and it's easy to kind of see. And he's a he's a fun character to play because he's so good. Like he's a goodly guy. He always does the right. He always tries to do the right thing. Doesn't always win. Yeah. Uh, but he's, he's, you know, he's the kind of guy you can cheer for. And he's, you know, half elven and half human, which makes yeah. him despised by both races. You know, so there's a, there's a moral to his story there. And then I top that off with another moral, which is he comes from, you know, uh, a very dangerous border town and he's mm-hmm. the lowest born noble in the realm. So all the highborns look down on him. Yeah. All the people that are mixed race look, you know, or, 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 or you know, pure, pure bloods look down on him because he's mixed race. Yeah. And yet he's the hero, yeah. you know, and you look at that and you're like, how, so you've got this lowborn knight of mixed blood and he's the hero and he gets to, he, fa- he falls in love with the, the highest elven princess who's not allowed to consort with him at all mm-hmm. because he's this low boy. He's, she, it would be, it would be disdainful for them to find out that he's, she's even talking directly to him. Mm-hmm. And yet she learns a valuable lesson about him and that nobility is not basically in your, you're not born with it. You earn it. Mm-hmm. And he's a noble warrior. And she eventually falls in love with him because of his acts and his deeds and not because of mixed blood or her society saying you can't do this or even the nobility saying you can't consort with him. And she gives up a lot which they wow. find out in books three and four, and then eventually in the second series that'll come out, what she's given up to be with him. And I think that Ritter would, I think there's a lot there. There's a lot of meat on the bone. And yeah. if I could play him for a day, I'd like to go back and play him for a day. That would be fun to do. So that's crazy. Like, what is, what is, where does this drive come from, you know, that you have with uh, when it comes to just you consistently, like, pushing an envelope when it comes to your writing, when it comes to your businesses, what makes you, you? I have obsessive compulsive disorder. 
And it's mm-hmm. not the same kind of, when people say that nowadays, they say it kind of flippantly. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm neat or I don't like that, you know, and, but it, it's running my family. My grandmother had it. My, my, uh, my mother had it. My brother and I have it all at varying levels. And for me, I've learned to make it a skill and an mm-hmm. asset as opposed to a detriment, because if you're an obsessive compulsive, there are things there that you're never going to be able to get over but you have to learn to deal with them. But it also makes you a perfectionist, yes. right? So I can't yeah. leave a story untold. I can't leave a detail out. I have to plan everything so that I can't, you know, I just don't sit down and start writing. I've already know what I'm going to write before I sit down to, to write it. And therefore the details are there. And I think that makes for a better story because you're not, there aren't any holes. You're not like, like I was, I was watching and I'm, I don't mean to cast aspersions no, on no. it, but I was watching the Rings of Power. Mm -hmm. uh on amazon the second season and you know once an episode i'm like wait what happened there like there was a you jumped ahead or this character doesn't exist or who is that again or why did they do that like i don't Mm -hmm. understand it just felt incongruent Mm -hmm. you know for me that i hope that in my books that never happens because i spent enough time obsessing about (laughs) it (laughs) those things don't happen and i can laugh about it but you know in all honesty you know i've tried to take something that some people might look at as a bad thing and make it a good thing. Mm. No, I got you. I got you. You know, we talk about anime. We talked about dark fantasy. We talked about stories that teach important life lessons, right? So what's one lesson from your writing or favorite anime or character that you think that everyone should learn from? Yeah. uh, I'm going to go back to, to Robotech here. I mentioned it a little earlier. So this is a (laughs) cheat code. But, you know, when people of Earth, regardless of race, color, and creed, find out that there's a a warrior alien class being sent to destroy them and recover a ship, everybody there just turns it off. And now all of a sudden we're all on the same team. Uh, And I think that's the lesson that needs to be taught. I mean, and we see it here. We don't hear about it as much as we used to in America. There were always pitted against one another yeah but when i was growing up and i went through school we were a melting pot Mm -hmm. and it was good and we needed to celebrate our differences and i think that that um and kind of growing up in the situation that i did which you know i basically you know we grew up in the hood right like i grew up i was i I grew up in a project yeah uh and it was it was a little different i didn't spend time there my dad pulled you know himself out of you know, he was a steel worker and, you know, we, yeah. you know, we got out of where we were into a better situation, which I think helped my brother and me for sure. But ultimately, you know, I learned that there's not much differences between people. Everybody can get along. And I think that that Robotech lesson or the American melting pot lesson is a lesson that's been lost. We see a lot. Mm-hmm. I get that in politics so much about mm-hmm. race baiting and gender baiting and religion and all this stuff. And it's like, do you realize that's why this country was founded? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, going back to 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 the quake. I mean, we all came here to escape persecution from this, and it's okay to be different, um, you know. And it's just you need to be accepting of it. And I think that that Robotech lesson, that anime lesson, and the American melting pot lesson is something that I think people need to start to harken back to. I, I totally, I totally agree with that. You know, because growing up as a kid, you know, I uh, grew up in Miami, Florida. My best friends uh, was Lenoy Galvez. Lenoy uh, was a um, Cuban American. He just came over. Um, he didn't know much English, so I taught him English. I taught him all the bad words. Yeah, of course you did. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but that was my guy. Like man, he was like uh, like a real good friend throughout high school, and. Um, you know, I appreciated him for being Cuban and I, I loved him for it. I always asked him questions. Uh, I tried to uh, use him to learn Spanish. I uh, didn't work too well because <laughs> I was trying to get the ladies. Uh, but yeah. Of course, of course. Yeah. But you said like a Milton pot, like it helped me uh, work with different people and understand different people and, and just go with an open mind. So I, I man. You, look, you, you yeah, spent all kid. that time in the military. You're going to tell me that people, that, that it goes away, man. Yeah. Sports makes it go away. Military makes it go away. Having those integrated communities makes it go away yeah you know because you you learn you all those things that you think you know and you're like well man i was wrong <laughs> yep, <laughs> you know, yep. just it's not just me so like I, I get it you know we're on one big team we just have to figure that out yeah 
Yeah, hundred percent. So for fun, as we uh, wrap things up, you know, I always like to ask, you know, if you could pick four of the best fantasy writers or creators to put on your Mount, uh, your Mount Rushmore, who would they be? Uh, number one would be J.R.R. Tolkien because he's the Ooh. granddaddy of them all, right? Yeah, so he agree. goes up there. He started the genre. If it was not for him, there would be uh, there would be none. The second one I would put up there is Margaret Weiss. Uh, she wrote uh, alongside Tracy Hickman the Dragonlance Chronicles and all the stories and sagas that have come from that. As well as she's dipped her toe. She used to work at Dungeons and Dragons, and I've loved all of her stuff from day one. Um, and so I would say Margaret Weiss. Number three would be R.A. Salvatore, okay. another D&D writer who has the Dark Elf trilogy and all of the Drift sagas and things like that. I think I would add that, add him because he's taken something to the next level. His his battle writing mm-hmm. has inspired my battle writing. You know, you listen to his audiobooks, you read his books and you're immersed in his world yeah. and it's in his battles that make his stories credible and you just fall in love with those characters and their struggles. And the last one, you know, and this, I don't know if this, this is going to work or not, <laughs> but I'm going to throw it out there anyway, yeah. is H.P. Lovecraft. Um, H.P. Lovecraft is not, not necessarily fantasy writer, mm-hmm. but he's so dark and he is poorer. And a lot of his stuff has a fantasy undertone to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, like Necronomicon and all the other stuff. It's just really, really good. Yeah. If you won't let me put him on there, and no, I get no, it if you don't. If, your list. if he's a disqualifier, I'll put Terry Brooks on from Sword of Shannara, the Shannara series, because Terry, <laughs> he's written like 30 books in the Shannara series, and it's, it's you know, I, I've loved every one of them. So I, I, yeah. he's my replacement for HP Lovecraft. I saw your face, so I know the Lovecraft's not going to last. So. No, no, no. Okay, we'll put Terry Brooks up there. No, How about that? That's you. That's your Mount, uh, your Mount Rushmore. I was thinking, I, I think you would say like uh, like Robert Jordan or something of that nature. Or um, I like Robert is, Jordan. Uh, my, my problem is Anderson? Brandon Sanderson is like yeah. the or Sarah Moss. Like yeah. those are more contemporary, okay. and I appreciate them for everything. But like I'm old school, man. You know yeah. what I mean? Like <laughs> you know, if you can't fix that, like I I like the the classics. Yeah. Like. You know, for me, I I love Bram Stoker. My favorite author is Bram Stoker. Like, okay. whose favorite author is Bram Stoker? <laughs> me. You know what I mean? It's a yeah. why. I don't know why. It just sure. is. You know, and yeah. I reread Dracula every single Halloween. I just love it. I do it. It's a, a tradition of mine. Okay. And, you know, but I love that kind of stuff. And I like to add that gothic to overtone to to make my epic fantasy dark epic fantasy. And I think okay. that's a lot of fun. And you don't see that. Yeah, you don't. That is 100% true. You don't. You don't. So... A uh, tradition of the show, what I like to do is open the floor up to you. So um, is it anything that you want to promote? Uh, anything you want to say? The floor is yours. Have at it. Well, sure. I mean, in brief, you could find me at jvhilliard.com. That's H-I-L-L-I-A-R-D. My books, my audio books and my ebooks are available pretty much anywhere you look for books. So if you're an Amazon shopper, you can find them on Amazon. You go to my publisher at Dragon Moon Press. Um, if you want to download them, they're on Audible or iTunes, wherever you want to get them. And the fourth book, the final book in the first quadrilogy, the Warminster Saga, just came out about three and a half, four weeks ago in September. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so for those of you that are listening or watching tonight and you don't buy books until the series is complete, the series is complete. You can go out and get it now. <laughs> so, so go check it out and, and get all four books and make sure you leave reviews. Yeah. The authors, it's a lifeblood of authorship. It helps mm-hmm. feed all the sales algorithms and, and it's important. So get out there. And I'm saying that for me and all the others that will follow me. Make sure you leave reviews. So, But thank you very much for your time tonight. It's been a pleasure. Oh, man. Thank you so much for your time. Now, before we get out of here, is, um, you know, I want to say uh, that it has been incredible. Uh, talking to you uh, and just finding more about your world. I think it's very, very fascinating. You know, uh, I try to start writing stuff like that for myself and I always uh, hit a lot of speed bumps, right? And I'm like, man, this is not for me. So I can just imagine as a writer, you coming up with so many different plot lines and you got everything running. You probably have like paper scribbles everywhere, you know, like boards. Um, I, I heard people have yeah. boards of like, like literally going down plot lines of this person, this character, this character, and, and and somehow magically they get everything together. So I really appreciate you coming coming here and basically uh you know sharing your world with us. So uh I'm very appreciative of that. So you My know pleasure. 
I, I thank you for it and uh, thank you for your time. So, if yep. any, uh, like, for having me. Hey, no problem. So, if anybody, uh, please go read his books. Uh, incredibly amazing, very insightful, very thoughtful author. Um, and make sure you leave those reviews. So, I right. peace. Nice, dude.